All right, welcome everyone to our first panel of the day on Foundation of Machine Learning. It's quite an honor for me to uh, moderate this panel with uh, all these uh, interesting uh, uh, new chairs. Um, so, Foundation in Machine Learning is, is a very interesting uh, time now to do uh, this kind of research because we're kind of at a cusp between uh, amazing empirical successes which uh, now we're trying to explain with theory and so there's a lot of new theory which, uh, which is yet to be developed uh, and so we're quite happy to have uh, uh, chairs here in Canada will both uh, work on new algorithmic development but as well as theoretical uh, justification and motivation for, for, for new advances in the field. So uh, first I will ask each uh, of the chairholder to uh, present yourself, uh, say uh, what's your research topic, and uh, about three minutes each. So perhaps we'll start with uh, UCMAC. Uh, one, two, three? Yes, good, okay. Uh, so my name is CMAC. Um, I'm affiliated with Mila, I'm at McGill. Um, so generally I'm interested in uh, representation learning, but, um, but more specifically these days I look at how we can use um, um, ideas, uh, foundations that have been developed in math and have been used maybe in physics a lot, uh, including the ideas from uh, in designing invariant functions uh, for better representation learning. Um, so that's one way of doing it. Uh, in the past, I've also been looking into um, uh, using graphical models for this purpose. Um, the previous Turing Award winner, uh, Judy O'Pearl, thought that um, Bayesnets were, mo uh, were going to model our brain, basically, because they could model the uncertainty uh, and they could model the causal relations within um, a, a bunch of variables. Um, and we could do inference and learning in those settings. But um, for some reason, that didn't take off. Now we are, we are um, using deep models mainly. Um, of course, these two are not exclusive. But within this um, framework of deep, deep learning, we are looking for more sample efficient representation learning. Uh, and that's, that's what I'm excited about. Great. So Courtney? Hello. Hi, um, I'm Courtney Paquette. Um, so I'm currently at Google Brain in Montreal, and I'll be joining the McGill Math and Statistics Department next year as part of Mila. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about my background. I actually did my undergraduate degree in finance and saw operations research and machine learning from there and decided that I wanted to go into it. And that's actually how I ended up doing my PhD. So I think it's interesting to come from a different background than most people. Uh, my research is actually in uh, optimization. So I did a lot of my work at non-smooth and non-convex optimization. Um, how do you structure to design algorithms when you don't have smoothness, for instance? Uh, I also did some work in non-smooth analysis and large-scale computing. And then more recently, I become very much interested in stochastic optimization and the role that statistics is now playing in obtaining good convergence guarantees and how can we design algorithms uh, now based upon the statistical guarantees. Um, and uh, something that I'm very much interested in is not really designing new algorithms anymore, but sort of trying to understand what these algorithms are currently doing. So understanding the landscape, how is the landscape affecting the algorithm, um, sort of how complexity works um, and that kind of stuff. So thank you. On there. <laughs> Great, thanks. Uh, Gennady, is that correct? Or no, it's uh, oh. Nathan. <laughs> it's hard to see. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, my name is Nathan Sturdivant and I'm at the University of Alberta. Um, before I say about my research, I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, being able to be successful as a researcher is a product of many mentors, family members, uh, particularly for me, my wife, and other people, and so I wanted to acknowledge that uh, before I talk about the work that I'm doing. Um, but my own work is in the area of search, very broadly defined, and I'm currently looking at the intersection of search and machine learning. 
So I've looked in search at uh, algorithms, understanding the theoretical properties of algorithms, and also how we can create very large data sets. And then we're now using these data sets with machine learning to understand um, what the machine learning is capable of doing, the limits of it, and how it combines with search in effective ways. Wonderful. Now, Gennady. Uh, I'm Gennady Pichimenka. I'm with the University of Toronto and Vector Institute. Uh, my expertise is mostly in computer architecture and systems. And as you can probably guess, I'm applying that for machine learning, which requires a huge compute capabilities these days. Uh, the most interesting problems uh, are related to what are the hardware that is actually useful for machine learning. And beyond that, the, uh, one of the most critical problems right now, how we can deliver all this performance seamlessly for ML people that are not necessarily aware of all that fancy hardware that's beneath uh, the system that you're using. And a lot of challenging tasks right now mostly related to the fact that every major company is trying to build their own hardware. So uh, starting from Google, uh, Amazon, uh, Huawei, and other companies and uh, hundreds of startups, they all want to jump on this market, and we all somehow need to satisfy uh, you know, uh, the ability of other people to run on this hardware. Great. Chris? Uh, hi, I'm Chris Madison. Uh, I'm currently a member at the Institute for Advanced Study, uh, but I'll be joining the University of Toronto and the Vector Institute next summer. Uh, I am interested in this sort of the, the hard algorithmic problems that live at the core of machine learning, and in particular, the ones that are useful for deep learning. I've worked in the past on probabilistic inference uh, and gradient estimation, and more recently, I've started working on optimization. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in the ways in which these, these sort of foundational problems of machine learning interact and can inform each other. Uh, so that's the kind of work I hope to push forward in, uh, in the next few years. Great, Christian. So uh, I'm Christian Garnier. I'm affiliated with Milia. I am a professor at the Computer Engineering Electrical Engineering Department from Université Laval in Quebec City. I'm part of the Computer Vision System Lab, Big Data Research Center, and so on. Um, um, my field is really about. I am feeling like uh, I always say that I am an, an applied guy for theoretician, and I'm a more conceptual theoretical guy for applied people. So I'm in between these two. I'm trying to develop methods that are kind of useful for engineering applications. Uh, I would say right now there's two main axes that I'm looking for is for like doing deep learning, but deep learning with uh, uh, small data sets. So be able to learn something or to adapt models quickly. Things like few shot learning, uh, meta learning, and uh, transfer learning. All these things is something I'm looking for. The other aspect is also to do uh, black box optimization, to do like uh, using methods that can optimize over functions that we don't have access to the analytical form. So, uh, and using probabilistic models on that, evolution strategies, and so on. Wonderful. And Pascal? Hello. My, <coughs> sorry. My name is Pascal Germain. I'm a new professor, assistant professor at Université Laval. I came back for, from France uh, one month ago, so I spent the last four years in, uh, in RIA in France. And um, so I have a background in computer science, but when I was doing my PhD in computer science uh, in machine learning, I learned a, a lot about statistics to be able to study machine learning algorithms. In the last two years, at, I was a research scientist at uh, in RIA Lille, and I was working in um, in the statistics team, so I like to uh, bridge the, the gap between what statisticians are doing and uh, more ma machine learning computer scientist people. And so right now I consider myself as a st statistical learning theorist, and my very specific um, subject of research is uh, statistical learning theory named the PAC Bayesian theory, uh, and it's a uh, it's a framework uh, from which I derive generalization guarantees on learning algorithms. And I also get uh, inspired by uh, the theoretical study to design new learning algorithms. And I try to use this to uh, study a lot of different problems on representation learning, transfer learning, and others. Great. All right. Thanks for all the introduction. So it's wonderful to be able to uh, learn what uh, your uh, research interests are, uh, and before we, we will move perhaps uh, into the future 
uh, we can start a discussion with a very CIFAR uh, question. Uh, so why is Canada and your AI Institute in particular the right place for you to be pursuing your research? And I think I'll let the volunteer first, otherwise I will name someone. Anybody wants to answer this question? I can start. Great. Um, That's so great. I'm a recruitment chair coming from the University of Denver, and the University of Denver uh, was interested in building an AI program, but um, if you look there at what they could build over several years' time versus what was at the University of Alberta, um, University of Alberta was step starting three tiers above uh, what would be possible there. And so the quality of my colleagues and the quality of the students to work with um, was just an amazing opportunity. And having experienced both the U.S. funding and the Canadian funding system, I have to say I much prefer the Canadian funding system. Anybody else? I'd like to sort of follow up on that. Um, this is related to the funding system, but also the culture of the Canadian research environment. I think it tends to support curiosity-driven research or high-risk, high-reward research. And I don't think it's any accident that, that two of the major subfields of artificial intelligence that are today generating so much buzz, deep learning and reinforcement learning, had two of their strongholds or three of their strongholds in Canada uh, and, and sort of sheltered those fields while maybe they were not the hot fields of, of machine learning. And I think that's happening today with work that's, that's going on today. And, and, and that sort of kindness and willing to take risks is something that Canada should be proud of. Anybody else? Hey, Christian? Uh, um, I would say I'm in, in a different position because in Laval University we have now four staff for chairs associated with Mila. So I think that the, the, the environment is interesting in the sense that we have access to this nice group in Montreal and we will develop collaboration. But at the same time in Laval we have, I would say, some kind of tradition of multidisciplinary collaboration. And so it's, I, I have the, I would say, the experience of having like interesting interactions with people from other fields and we tend to have a nice dialogue and it's, I think it's kind of really uh, enriching a lot the, the, the thinking, the, the, how the research is done, especially when you have some kind of, uh, I would say, uh, apply view without doing applications purely but having something that like uh, feed uh, ideas. I think, I think this is really interesting and for students it's help them to get connection with many other domains, I think. Great. Anybody else wants to add something? So I think collaboration is, is also one of the, the key points, uh, especially that that's one of the uh, attractive points which attracted me to Mila was this, this, this uh, collaboration with multiple universities and also with like uh, startups and uh, the government and everything. So it's, it's a very stimulating environment. Um, so perhaps now let's talk about uh, interesting research. So um, anything in your field that you found particularly exciting in the last year or that you're, you're, you're perhaps which we will look, they will be talked about at NeurIPS that you would like to share about? Oh, you want to go in turns? I, don't know. I go with volunteers <laughs> because there's too many of you and I don't see you, but uh, I can go in turns if you want. Samak. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, there is this, um, this paper that I'm um, excited about um, from Max Filling's group on um, um, gauge equivariant neural networks. So uh, the idea was so far the models that we could build, the way we could generalize convolution to other domains uh, was that you needed to define a sort of global symmetry on your domain. You, you could look, look at a sphere, look at a graph, look at a set, and you look at their symmetries. But now there is this new paper that says, well, you don't need this global symmetry. You can apply the same sort of ideas uh, on general manifolds and build this theoretical foundation to do that. Symmetries. So I think there's a lot of use. I don't think I will go through all of them. I'll, I'll go for people who are excited about what they want to talk about. You can just jump. Oh, Chris. Um, yeah, so this is actually maybe not new work in the sense of an advance or a new idea, but retrospective work that tries to sort of carefully evaluate uh, the current situation. And I'm thinking in particular of some recent empirical work coming out of Google Brain, uh, led by Chris Chalou and George Dahl, on trying to evaluate the effect of batch size for sort of very classical optimization algorithms in deep learning. And uh, actually, as Roger Gross pointed out, the, the sort of surprising thing about that work was that there was no surprise. And they sort of carefully uh, clarified some confusions in the literature 
and laid out a very compelling empirical picture of what's really happening on the ground. And the current culture in machine learning is not quite as supportive as I would like of that kind of work, and I think it's really important because it can, it can give guidance to theorists about what kind of questions they should be asking, what kind of things we might expect when we do theory, and that's really important as we're, as we're sort of developing simpler models uh, for which we have theoretical traction. Yeah. Um, I don't want to talk about any specific work. I want to talk about more like about big research direction. So if you look at the list of sponsors of NeurIPS, uh, you're going to see the usual suspects, but you're also going to see a lot of new companies that a lot of you probably not heard about, like Graphcore, Cerebrus, and many others. They all are now here is just because they try to make an impact, right? So they're all building machine learning hardware, and uh, they got tons of funds for that, and there is a, big, a lot of competition. Uh, you can ask, why is it important for us as a researchers? Well, it's important with respect to how we are going to actually evaluate and properly compare which one actually worth versus not worth it. Because there's a lot of media claims about one hardware being 10x, 100x faster than others, and you really need to be able to fairly compare uh, what's better on, on, and what's actually performing better for your workload. Uh, in that in mind, there was a consortium created called MLPerf that has uh, both academia participants and industry participants, and we already had several releases uh, for training and inference where you can actually have results that you can compare and look for your uh, <coughs> models as well uh, that you can see uh, and numbers that actually all companies sign on. And that includes the startups I mentioned, that includes big companies like Google and NVIDIA that actually put head-to-head -head numbers. And again, in the line of spirit that uh, Chris said, a lot of people thought that one was going to be 100 of X better than others. And for architects, there's no surprise there, but others, there's a lot of surprise. There's not that dramatic difference claimed in all this blog post about one being much better than the other one. There are differences, there are some nuances, but it's not as dramatic as people claimed before. Just uh, Something, it's not a specific work, but it's a bunch of work that I saw in the last two years. Just to make, give some background, I, I've got my PhD in evolutionary computation applied to pattern recognition. I did a lot, I was like 50-50 between machine learning and evolutionary computation up to like five years ago, six years ago. And then I decided to drop this field because feeling a little tired of all the heuristic approach of biologically inspired stuff. And then I saw like two years ago a, a regain in machine learning of evolution strategies and all these approaches, population-based training, all these things like uh, optimizing deep networks for reinforcement, for reinforcement learning with evolution strategies. So I was kind of skeptical at first because I was saying, well, I know these things and I'm not sure it will, it will, it has a lot of things to do, but in fact, uh, I'm more and more convinced that it is really interesting. So I think that there is this kind of, of orientation that is uh, really exciting. So I'm, I think I will, I will look at it in more closely because it kind of get me back to the roots where I was trained during my PhD. If I can just stick one thing in. So I am Please, not, NeurIPS isn't a conference that I typically come to uh, because I like to go to broader AI venues. Um, but uh, the field of search is something that is over 50 years old and uh, it's very easy to say, oh, all the questions have been answered. But in the last four to five years, there's been fundamental changes in our understanding of algorithms and the way things work in that field. And so uh, to this audience particularly, I would say, encourage you, if you're thinking about search, to be uh, making sure that you're looking at the state of the art. And I'm, of course, be more than glad to talk to people about that. Anybody else? Pascal? Maybe I will point just an interesting line of work uh, that I think I'll be starting by uh, Michael Belkin for, by a paper that appears on archive one year ago, approximately. And um, what is known now as, I think, the double descent curves. And in, in statistical learning, uh, the common uh, uh, knowledge or wisdom was that uh, we must not um, uh, use uh, uh, models with uh, too much power uh, to uh, avoid overfitting. And uh, he uh, empirically and uh, theori theoretically showed that under some circumstances, uh, in fact, he showed what we were observing in the neural network, but he, uh, uh, he really um, designed some small example when we see that 
uh, very overparameterized models can in fact generalize better, and uh, it's really fun because it gives some uh, small, almost toy problem where, where where we can see the same behavior that are appearing that we were observing in the huge neural network. So, from a statistical learning per perspective, we can really study these uh, behaviors. Courtney. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Um, so maybe I should start off with what I'm not excited about. Is that <laughs> possible? That works too. Um, I, I'm not excited about an optimization. There's this, there's this push to show complexity, um, you know, to produce the best algorithm, you know, get epsilon to the five, seven fifth, seven fifths, I think. Um, you know, trying to get, you know, the best algorithm out there without really understanding what the algorithm is actually doing. Um, and so this is something that I want the, com like the ML community and optimization in the ML community to move away from and move towards more understanding what is actually happening instead of trying to produce the latest, greatest algorithm out there so that we can actually, you know, better design the algorithms themselves later on. If we understand what's going on, then we can help design better algorithms out there. Has everyone in? I think so, yeah. Okay, good. Um, so there's a lot of uh, you who actually do optimization. So perhaps to, to get things a bit uh, spiced up, perhaps something controversial, uh, I get a lot of students in deep learning coming to me and say, oh, who cares about optimization? I just use Adam. And what's the use of optimization research, especially when what we care about is not optimization, is actually generalization error. So, What's your thought of this, on this? The panel, <laughs> people in general, but yeah, you can, you can start, Courtney, if you want. Who wants to, to, to motivate optimization in the modern era of machine learning? Or an answer to these grad students come to me, say, I can just use Adam in PyTorch and I guess I can answer this question. Um, or maybe I'm the most qualified, I don't know, <laughs> um, since I said I do optimization. Um, yeah, I think th it's interesting, okay, so I, I, I go to Mila sometimes and I hear this also, that students are just like, oh, I, why do I care? I just use Adam or Adagrad, um, or I guess they don't use Adagrad, they just use Adam. Um, and it, the thing which is interesting is they don't actually, again, this, this is this idea, they don't really understand or we don't really understand why, they, why these algorithms are working. So they're working for a very specific reason. And in optimization, it's not just, again, about producing a complexity result or com on, say, a training error, but it's actually understanding why the algorithm is doing what it's doing, whether it's a curvature, whether it's noise, whether, um, you know, you're you're getting more second order information or something. There, there's usually something else involved. The landscape plays a role. Um, the objective function plays a role. Uh, we forget this, but you know, you can change your loss. It's totally fine to change your loss function to make it easier to optimize. That's a completely legitimate thing. Um, and uh, I think that there is a lot more to optimization and that the machine learning um, sometimes glosses over it, um, just because there's a lot of other things that we want students to know, and so we don't really have time to go into a theory side of optimization, which has been around for, I think, like, for quite a while now. Anybody else wants to chime in? Uh, I just want to add sort of a meta point on top of uh, Courtney, uh, Courtney's point, which is that uh, it's very hard to know ahead of time whether or not you can make progress. And that kind of goes both ways, right? You can, you can try to prejudge ideas and decide, well, uh, you know, I don't see how this is going to work. But of course, that was true before Adagrad and Adam were invented. And obviously, they've had a huge impact on our field. So there's sort of significant uncertainty over the future. And in the face of that, what you should be doing is working on what you're interested in, not what you can tell today is going to work. 
Yeah, I can say a few words in addition to that. So from the system's perspective, all these new algorithms, all the possibilities to change the objective function, hyperparameters is a nightmare. So whenever we need to make a comparison against competitors, say NVIDIA versus Google versus another company submitting their best results, and all these are moving targets, that becomes a nightmare. So we, uh, at AmelProf, we go back and forth around how to make things fair and at the same time not limit the innovation. And the best thing we came up so far was the ability to steal the hyperparameters from others. So essentially when the submission happens, uh, um, everyone submits their best results, but then it turns out if some company X just innovate not really like on the algorithm level, right? But it doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, you know, better hardware or better software stack, then the others can look and reuse it in their own submissions to make it more fair. So that's the best strategy we came up with, yeah. Overall, uh, for us, it's the fewer the algorithm, the better. The, um, I'm not an expert on these algorithms, obviously, but I ha I've heard recently a very nice talk by George Dahl from Google where he made uh, a nice comparisons between at least some order uh, on which algorithms are better than others if proper comparisons are made. Yeah, hyperparameter choice is, is very expensive. Uh, so at Mila, we also care a lot about uh, climate change in particular. And so the amount of, of GPU hours which have been spent uh, tuning hyperparameters, I think that's, that's one place also where uh, algorithmic advances will be uh, very useful. Uh, Christian, you wanted to say something? Maybe I would say to get back to the question about Adam and the likes. I think it's, it's very relevant for supervised learning where your signal is kind of clear. But in some other cases, like in RLR, like when you want to do hyperparameters optimization, you, want, you need to optimize over the optimization, optimize over the model. So I think in such case, it's different kind of optimization. So there is, there is room to, to explore these things. And I, I don't think, yeah, I agree that for like some kind of differential models that you can use directly, some kind of backprop, it makes sense. But there are other cases I think that we need to, to look at. Great. So um, also like uh, one of the big point of the uh, Canon C4 AI chair program is to, to train uh, the next generation of, uh, of, of talent. Uh, so uh, what would be the, the best advice you would have for students interested in your area of machine learning? Like what can grad students be doing now to prepare for future academy, uh, careers in academia and industry that you would like to share? Okay, I have a thought. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, I, I find it really strange that right now in AI and machine learning, there's incredible resources. Uh, we've, we've been given sort of a very long leash by many different organizations, countries, funding agencies. And at the same time, the sense I get from uh, colleagues, friends, students, is that they, they feel this huge demand to publish in volume, to just get paper after paper after paper out. And especially at the beginning of a career, I don't think that's a great strategy. So my advice would be to follow your interests, to develop your sort of unique perspective on the field. If that's one paper a year, that's perfectly fine. You can make up for the volume later if you decide you want to go into academia. Um, but that investment at the beginning of your career is really going to, to sort of support you in the future. So longer term view. Yes. Anybody else? Um, I can add a little bit to Chris's point. So I think we're in academia to take risks, right? So what I encourage my student is not afraid to take on the aggressive uh, uh, directions in research. Like, for example, one student that started with me about a year ago came to me and said, okay, I think backpropagation is just the wrong strategy to do, uh, you know, uh, optimization. It's fundamentally bad. We're trying to optimize it after that on the software level, but there is a fundamental sequential dependencies there, and there's nothing that we can do about it. So we just need to break that dependency. And the problem comes with that. He came up with a very nice idea on the theoretical end, but the problem was that the whole uh, central NVIDIA stack is fully not ready for that. So if you want to go take the trials, you need to be ready for months and months of engineering and optimization. And eventually, we were able to get something interesting out of it and beating the state-of-the-art baseline with backpropagation. But you need to have courage and convince the student also that should be brave enough to move into a risky direction with high reward and high promise. Courtney, and then Christian. Oh. Um, yeah, so I, I want to take something slightly different uh, viewpoint. Um, advice I would give to a graduate student um, is actually to take a class 
or get some experience uh, in communication. Um, I think that it's, we're lacking in like sciences that we don't actually teach people how to create slides or give a talk or you know do a poster. It's sort of ad hoc. But you know, in other fields like business, for instance, you know this is what they do and they know how to explain it. Um, and I think that it's extremely important now, especially in AI, to be able to communicate results to other people. Um, I, I think it's, we, we, we shouldn't be trying to make things look really complicated. We should be trying to make it so that it's understandable to the majority of the people out there. And so my advice would, for students out there is to, you know, take a class in communication. <laughs> um, learn how to do some of these skills. Question? I would say uh, you just, sometimes my students, when they are starting a PhD, they maybe look at the trends and try to follow the trends. And, and I always advise them to not go in things that are too trendy because they will be in the, lost in the crowd and it will be really difficult to, to mark your, 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 to do something that is, uh, I would say, meaningful uh, because you are kind of uh, in competition with big teams and many people. I say so usually the, what I'm suggesting to my students is to look at different things, to be open, to be curious about the different domains and maybe try to make connections and, and figure out maybe new topics or maybe topics that are on the edge of the current trendy topics but that can be really, I would say, uh, interesting and original in terms of, of proposing something new that is relevant but still not in the in the spot of what everyone is trying to do right now. So it's somehow to anticipate it. And I, I feel that sometimes it worked really well, and we were, uh, I was happy to see that we, in fact, <coughs> developed something, and, and, and we were on topic that, like, six months, one year after that, people get into such ideas. So I think that's, that's, we need to really try to avoid doing like the others are doing, try to do something that has some potential of being, uh, I would say, uh, anticipatory of what's going on. If I could Nathan? <clears throat> add to the last two, which is to say um, I would advise students to be aware of the history of AI, what got us to where we are today, what are the broader questions that are being asked and answered. And uh, that can do two things. Is one, it just uh, gives you perspective, but it also can help you understand what are the ways that people are thinking and how can we, maybe there's different questions we should be asking that are not being asked. And that's a, a place where then you can make uh, strong inroads or even open up new areas. And, uh, and understanding what's being done before means that you uh, do a better job of not repeating things or understanding uh, what, what mistakes were and how we can improve on them in the, in the future. All right. Um, so you have all fairly uh, broad backgrounds. So uh, do you have uh, examples perhaps of, of new tasks uh, in machine learning uh, that, uh, that has been identified that, that we didn't really think about in the past or applications, new type of data that you would like to, to share? How far in the past? Oh. <laughs> Ten years ago was not there. Five years ago. So, so I think the uh, appli new application areas, um, not specifically new tasks, but um, application of machine learning in, for example, astronomy and cosmology is sort of mm -hmm. uh, a more recent one that I've been um, involved in, in some projects in. Um, but it, it comes with its own challenges. For example, you get huge data sets, uh, but these are not new new tasks, new, new settings in which you define new problems, uh, more of uh, new applications. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not sure this has been unrecognized or sort of so novel that no one's seen it, but I think th there's sort of a big source of untapped data that some people are looking at, uh, but we could look at much more, which is the data that we produce ourselves. So. Uh, our source code, stack traces of algorithms that are running, all of this data is, occupies a very, very small part of all possible programs or all possible stack traces. And so it really represents something about what humans care about in the world and it has specific distributions and we generate tons of this data. So doing machine learning uh, sort of to inform uh, perhaps software engineering or, uh, or basic algorithms 
I think is, is sort of a rich area that is, is really blowing up right now. Christian? Uh, maybe a, a field that I think can be, uh, we need to look at. We are looking at it, but maybe not as closely as can be, is all the, the systems that involve human in the loop. You know, we have a lot of data that are about people or clicking or doing this thing, but maybe if we are looking more at the case where we really have an interaction between the system and the people and try to do something that is able to customize, to be fit to the person really quickly, I think this is something where we can really get into a systems that are collaborating somehow with humans and are able to, 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 to get into specific behaviors that are fit to the person that is using the system. That's something I think uh, we need to look at closely. Anybody else? Oh, um, Kennedy. I'm personally interested in the privacy aspects and the ability to do essentially training at the edge, right? So this is something that I don't know, five, 10 years ago was unimaginable because the compute power was not uh, possible. And right now people are actively talking about it, trying to come up with creative protocols on federated learning or uh, incremental learning at the edge. And I think that's an interesting direction and application for me. I think it's gonna have a huge potential in the future. Great, thanks a lot for everyone. Uh, so I think it's time now to open the floor to the questions from the audience. Anybody would like to ask a question to our panelists? Yes, of In the back over there, do we have a mic or the screen? activated microphones. Um, the panel is about foundations of machine learning, and I haven't heard anyone say anything about semantics. Um, if you remember at the end of the 60s, um, natural language processing hit this brick wall called the confronting the meaning of language. And well, um, as a computer scientist, I'm extremely happy to hear you talk about um, what might be approximation algorithms and complexity and focus when you talk about refining algorithms. Some of you also talked about preparing students so that they can interact with industry. I want to hear more about foundations of studies, so I haven't heard anybody say the word logic even once. And I watch all of my deep learning colleagues reinventing concepts from the 50s in mathematics, pursuing, I think, the correct goals but not somehow excited or interested about what's created the foundations that guide your heuristic choices when you make decisions like in um, uh, guided search and gradient search and all the other things we do. So does anybody want to tackle that? So what's your question? <laughs> the, the quest, the Actually, question, I have a question for you. So do you think logic so the is the foundation of machine learning? So, so the question of it, logic is the foundation of semantics. Okay, fair right. enough. And if you're interested in how you're confronting the brick wall of semantics and explainability, which is the reinvention of terms, which is fine from a long history, I haven't heard anybody talk about how to confront that very difficult problem. Instead, it's like the old joke about the man looking for his keys under the street light. It's not where he lost them, but that's where the light is. So I think that this is something that's serious that I encourage all my new graduate students to do, to read a book, any book, about logic and semantics, to be able to guide their work in building models automatically, semi-automatically, labeled or unlabeled, data supervised or unsupervised, to be able to make sense of a next generation of machine learning. All right, anybody wants to? Anybody want to tackle Comments? that? You, you should all be tackling that, by the way. So I'm just going to... Well, so, sorry, sorry. I just oh, okay. want to yeah. mention yeah. Uh, an important point, uh, is that diversity of approaches and research is super important. So saying that everybody should tackle a specific question, I don't think is appropriate for a research field. I, I think that's right. But okay. you can't ignore the foundations of where semantics and the association between meaning and the world and the symbols we push around inside of computers comes from. And that, that's a trajectory that I think is, um, distracts us from what the real goals of artificial intelligence are. 
Thank you. So, Chris, you, you were going to say something? Um, I don't think I can answer the totality of that question, but um, I, I think part of the answer might be, or sort of the historic answer, that the deep learning community had a very specific background and had some founding effects in terms of what has been worked on over the last five to ten years as the community grows, and that's natural and that's fine. Um, but one of the advantages of being a field that's growing is that new people are coming in. And so there's a lot of exciting work that's happening at the intersection of some of these more classical fields and deep learning. One of the areas that I'm very excited about is verification of neural networks. And here you can see very natural overlaps. You, I mean, you have people coming in from more traditional fields, uh, informing us in deep learning and maybe learning something from us. And I think that's the space where these things are happening. And the kind of interactions we should encourage, as opposed to asking that someone somehow rewrite their own history. I think that's a good answer. Good. Any other question? Ben. Shy. Shy, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, I mean, there's a lot of optimization, I mean, here in the, in the panel. And uh, I, I heard that a theme among you that bothers me, and uh, I think Courtney uh, expressed it explicitly, saying when the optimization is difficult, don't be afraid of changing the objective. And to me, it sounds like, you know, if I hear that there's a traffic jam on my way to work, maybe I should go to the gym instead, because <laughs> I will improve the optimization and just change my objective. And it's not just Courtney, I see it a lot in, in papers. People are saying, you know, uh, this uh, objective, uh, you know, zero one loss is difficult, or K means is difficult. But here is a, a, you know, another objective that I can write as a, a convex optimization, and let's op the, uh, you know optimize that. But you know, we have a goal, and uh, there is a reason why we want this objective. And optimizing something different is kind of maybe exciting for optimization people, but pointless for the target. So um, halfway answering your question, which is I, I do work with the games industry. And working with the games industry, oftentimes the problem isn't even well defined. So in such contexts, I would assert that it was completely valid to actually change your problem definition because maybe the problem definition isn't even known and then we're, we can work with that to go around it. But I do agree that you know, we, we don't always want to just completely change the problem or ignore something because it's hard to work on. Hard problems you know, are meant to work on because we can, you know, with more hard work we can make progress on them. And actually I'd like to clarify that in the optimization field usually the optimization objective is, is fixed. So it's, it's more a machine learning uh, luxury that we are able to change the optimization or approximate it because uh, it's not necessarily exactly what we really want to care about. Do you want to say something more, Courtney? Oh, sorry. I actually want to say kind of um, that the optimization community has actually moved kind of more in your direction also. For instance, um, I do work in non-smooth and non-convex and for a long time people were like, I will never touch a convex problem. I will never touch a non-convex problem. Let's always convexify it, right? Um, but because now there's been research, basically in, in machine learning, pushing towards uh, non-convexity, people are going back and looking up these objective functions. And this is sort of what I mean. It's like, okay, <laughs> maybe the problem that we're looking at isn't exactly right. Maybe we can actually find a better objective function. Um, that's more of what I was looking for. Thanks. Thank Any other question? Irina? Yeah. Thank you very much for a very interesting panel. And while listening to answers to previous questions, I couldn't help myself but think about, well, objective of our field. I hear a lot of arguments about what's right and wrong. For example, I agree that backpropagation has its issues such as chain of gradients, vanishing gradients, and so on. But does it mean that we should call it right or wrong? Doesn't it depend on context? And the same thing about logic discussion and other things. Uh, my question is, how maybe should we try to define common objectives from perspective of which it will be more clear to say 
uh, what we focus on and what we need right now. For example, if the problem, if the problem is to do the low level kind of reasoning uh, in neural net, then maybe what we're doing is appropriate for this context. If we really try to model high level concepts, then yes, we need to take a look at logic. But I think arguing about what's right and wrong without providing well-defined problem is not very productive. So here is my question, like, do you think we could have defined like Gilbert's top 10 problems of AI for ourselves so we would be a bit more focused and say for this problem that would be the right approach and that approach would be wrong but not in general, because without context, it's very hard to kind of compare things. Do you think it would be a bit more productive approach to the kind of moving the field forward? All right, so the CIFAR top 10 problems of AI. Anybody wants to uh, have a shot at this? So I can just uh, give a short answer. Um, well, for myself, I do have these open problems that I think a few people that work closely on, on similar areas care about, but I don't think uh, these are just a stepping stone and it may not be, they may not be of interest to the broader community at this point. Maybe if you make more progress, then, then it becomes more important to the, to the general AI audience. I think that, that might be true for, for many other people. You're, you're focused on one specific area and you have this, this particular problem that you want to solve. Um, but if you're just talking to someone else, it may not seem very um, high impact or very broad enough, uh, that particular open problem. Um, so I don't know how easy it would be to define uh, a list of 20 open problems for everybody. One interesting thing is I'm not familiar with other fields than the Hilbert's problems. I'm not sure. Perhaps there's learning theory where they also list open problems, but I, in uh, less theoretical fields, I think it's pretty hard to identify these uh, clear, well-defined, open questions. Not sure if anybody else has something to say about this. Chris? Uh, yeah, I actually think, well, I think it's a bit of a feature and not a bug of artificial intelligence. Well, yeah. What I love about it is that I don't think the paradigm has fully settled. And the field is going to naturally resist any attempt to do that. We could sit and try to do that today, and we might come up with a bunch of problems about neural networks. If we had done that 50 years ago, we might have come up with a bunch of problems about logic. And, uh, and then the next Jeff Hinton's going to come along and ignore those 10 problems and possibly revolutionize the world. And I think we're not yet at a point where these can be well-defined in a way that we can guarantee progress towards an objective we can defend if they were solved. Yeah, and I think one of the, um, the uh, characteristics of the field is it being so multidisciplinary, people are coming from very different perspectives and also with very different objectives. Uh, and so um, I'm not sure we really need to make all them focus on, on specific questions. Well, thank you for your answers. I agree with part of them, but not all of them, and I guess we'll agree to disagree. I think that it is possible to define certain common directions, and it might be a bit more productive. And I also don't think you need to wait for the next Jeff Hinton. Why won't you be one? <laughs> Just think about it. All anyway, right. I, I'll let the uh, Thanks, other person to ask the question. Thank you. Who's the next one? I'm just going to follow up on that comment and say that think of it not so much as constraining your choices, but inc increasing your resources. So the typical way that Grand Challenge uh, lists are created is in a blue ribbon panel of leaders like yourself that then give reasons for funding agencies to put resources behind those tasks to increase the total amount of resources and the focus on a problem and the benchmarks around them. So it's actually a pretty good exercise to do and it's worth investing time in. Great, thanks. So is there any final questions?
No? All right, so I think that will uh, wrap up uh, this panel. Let's thank our panelists again. <laughs>